What is going on, everyone? Today, we're going to be talking about capacitors and everything you need to know in order to start using them in your own circuits. Capacitors are one of the most common components you'll see in modern electronics, so understanding how to use them is very important for electrical engineering. Learning about capacitors can be broken up into two main parts. Part one is understanding capacitors as a fundamental circuit element. Knowing how they behave in certain scenarios and what equations we can use to model that behavior is a great place to start. To learn about capacitors as fundamental circuit elements, we are going to analyze some circuits, run a few simulations, and then walk through some of the important equations that model capacitors' behavior. I will try to include as many real-world examples as I can because I think it's important to show how the knowledge that we are learning right now is applicable to real-life scenarios. There's going to be some information not included in this video series, but this is definitely going to be enough to get you started with using capacitors in your own designs. Okay, so the first place I want to start is just going to be the basic anatomy of a capacitor. So here on the right, I have a picture of a capacitor that I pulled off of Google Images. This is an example of an aluminum electrolytic capacitor. So this one looks like it's 50 volts, 1000 microfarads. And then also looks like it's a through hole component as well. So you would just, you know, slide these th two pins through the holes on the PCB and solder it. And then that's how you kind of hook the capacitor up to the circuit. But what a capacitor is really is just two metal plates separated by some insulator, also known as a dielectric. So in the example on the right, I said it was an aluminum electrolytic capacitor. So that means the plates are made out of aluminum. And then for the dielectric material, there are a variety of materials we can use. You can use ceramics, you could use something, some polymer like paper, or you could even have something like air act as a dielectric. When a voltage source is hooked up to a capacitor, it deposits positive charges on one of the plates and negative charges on the other. In this way, a capacitor sort of acts like a battery, storing energy that can be released at a later time. The voltage across the capacitor increases as more and more charges are deposited onto it. For example, in this simulation, we have a current source hooked up to a capacitor. And the reason I chose a current source is because I want to demonstrate something that's it's continuously depositing charge onto the capacitor. And so we see the voltage of the capacitor is continuously rising. And this will, it'll do this forever in this simulation. So notice how the voltage of the capacitor steadily increases as more and more charges are deposited onto it. The relationship between the number of charges on the plates and the voltage level of the capacitor is shown in this equation right here. So we have Q is the number of charges and V is the voltage and and then C is what is known as the capacitance of the capacitor. So this is just some type of linear multiplier that is supposed to have some type of proportional relationship between the voltage and the number of charges. Common capacitance ranges that you'll see in real life are in the like picofarads all the way up to like the microfarads range. You can definitely go higher than that, but the most common range is like you know, picofarads to microfarads. A capacitor acts like an open circuit to a DC voltage source. There is going to be some initial current. There is some initial flow of charge as the plates of the capacitor fill up with charges, but once the voltage of the capacitor reaches the same voltage as our voltage source, no current flows. You can see we're dwindling here and we're going to reach zero amps. All right, so now this is basically an open circuit once the capacitor voltage has reached the same level as our voltage. A capacitor will resist any changes to its voltage. An ideal capacitor will supply infinite current in order to keep its voltage level the same. So what I have here is just three copies of the same circuit, but I just have different load resistors on the output. And so I'm just going to show you how whenever this capacitor gets charged, it's going to supply as much current as necessary to keep the voltage constant. In this 1K example, you see, so here we have a fully charged capacitor is charged up to five volts. And then whenever we, you see when we connect to the 1K resistor, we're starting at five volts and it's supplying as much current as necessary to keep that level, or it's at least trying to, right? Because, because because as the capacitor discharges, the voltage level is going to drop. So it can't maintain this forever, So, but it's going to try its best. And then the same thing happens here. You see we just have a lot less current. So it's able to, if you see, it gets drained much slower than it did in the 1K example because that means the current requirement is much lower. And then the same is even true for 100K, right? So the bigger this resistor, the longer this capacitor can stay charged. And that's a good, that brings up a really good point is in a capacitor left unloaded like say say this resistance was like a giga ohm or something this capacitor will hold its charge for days weeks or even months so it's very important that you are extremely cautious if you're working with any high voltage circuits because 
just say say you unplug your circuit from power, but your capacitor has still been charged, this is still going to be live, right? Imagine having this hooked up to 350 volts. You know, maybe you've leave, left it alone for 10 or 15 minutes, so you think, oh, it's fine to handle because, you know, it's not plugged into power, but this capacitor could still be very live and still be very dangerous. So just it's important to be very careful with stuff like that. So I have here another simulation that shows we have three 10 microfarad capacitors in series and we have three in parallel. So the equivalent capacitance for any amount of capacitors in series follows this equation right here. We have one over C total equals one over C1 plus one over C2 plus one over C3 and so on. So that means for this circuit right here, if we did that equation, we would get the equivalent capacitance to be 3.3 microfarads. Then for capacitors that are in parallel, they just sum according to this equation right here, which is very straightforward, just C1 plus C2 plus C3. So for this circuit right here, the equivalent capacitance is equivalent to 30 microfarad. In real life, capacitors have something known as leakage resistance, which is represented by a resistor that is in parallel with a capacitor. Typically, this leakage resistance is something in the giga ohm range, so I just used a 10G resistor like that. But understanding that there are, we'll call parasitic elements to these components is a really good, it's an important thing to take note of, and something we'll talk more about in part two, actually. Now we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into that explanation and examine the charging and discharging curves of a capacitor over time. You see, capacitors do not charge and discharge in a linear fashion. In fact, their curves are actually like exponential. So here I have a simulation where we're plotting the voltage of a capacitor over time. And so you can kind of watch it whenever I connect the output to a like load resistor, right? So you can see here that over time, the uh, the curve is kind of like an exponential decay function and it's kind of, you know, sloping off to this, the zero volt line. And it actually follows this equation right here, which is um, B naught, which is your initial capacitor voltage. So in our example, that was five volts times this value here. So E to the negative T, T is time divided by this Greek letter tau and all tau is is this value um, R times C. And in this case, R is the resistance of the, re the load resistor, and then C is the capacitance of the capacitor. So if we look at our example right here, our load resistance is 10 kilo ohms, and our the capacitance of our capacitor is 10 microfarads. So you multiply 10 micro times 10,000, and that gives you the time constant in seconds. So what the time constant is, is just a the amount of time it takes the capacitor to discharge to 36.8% of its initial value. You'll see a lot of references to time constants and integer multiples of the time constant. You'll have like um, tau, um, you know, two tau, 5 tau, et cetera, and those just represent different levels of the, the capacitor's initial voltage. You have like 36.8%, you have like 12%, you know, and so on and so forth until it's kind of tapers off to, to zero volts. And the graph of the charging curve is actually very similar. So let's go back to our simulation that we were just running and we'll watch it charge up. So as you can see, it's also an exponential decaying curve. Um, it's kind of tapering off as we're slowly approaching the source voltage, which is 5 volts right here. And then let's go back to this equation right here. So we have Vs, which is your V steady state or V supply, plus, and you have your quantity V0, which is your initial capacitor voltage. In our case, this was 0 volts. And then you have, again, V steady state slash V supply, and then times, again, our quantity E to the negative T divided by tau, and tau, again, is our time constant, which is our resistor times the, the resistance of our resistor times the capacitance of our capacitor. In our case, again, it was 10 kilo ohms times 10 microfarads. So if V naught equals zero volts, you can actually just simplify this equation down to Vs plus Vs times this whole quantity right here, and then that's what forms the shape of this curve. For the time constant of this curve, it actually is one time constant is how long it takes to achieve, it'll, it would be one minus this value, one minus 36.8%. So that would actually be 63.2% of, so one time constant is how long it takes to achieve 63.2% of its final voltage, of its steady state voltage. And an AC circuit, 
Capacitors behave more like resistors with a variable resistance that is inversely proportional to the frequency of our AC signal. That means as the frequency of our signal rises, the impedance of our capacitor decreases. I notice how I say impedance and not resistance, and I do that on purpose, and we'll talk more about that in another video when I talk about like the time domain and reactive elements and stuff like that, but just that was just a note I wanted to make. This inverse relationship capacitors have with AC signals is one of the driving factors behind one of their most common applications, which is just as a filter. So let's take a look at this example I have here. So I have a DC voltage source, which is 12 volts. Then I have an AC voltage source, which is 2.5 volts with a frequency of one. What I'm gonna do is well, let's run the simulation real quick. And you can see basically what we have is some AC you know, current source with a DC offset, right? Um, now let's say we were trying to filter out the AC signal and just get our clean 12 volt DC. Well, as I mentioned before, to a DC voltage source, this capacitor is going to behave like an open circuit. So that means no current from the DC voltage source is going to flow onto these plates once they're... However, to an AC current source, this capacitor is going to act more like a really, really low impedance pathway to ground. So it's basically just going to short all of this signal to ground. So watch what happens whenever I close this, close this switch and connect this capacitor to the circuit. So let me just speed up. So basically what happens is if you see, it's kind of like we've completely filtered out the AC part of this signal, right? So whenever we open the switch, it, you see the noise on it. And then whenever we close it, we keep the offset, but we don't have any noise here. So what we're effectively doing is we've created a filter to filter out any of this, the noise and just keep our clean. And I would say 90% of the time when you see a capacitor on a circuit board, this is what it's being used to do. It's just to filter out any type of noise, help maintain a very clean signal. So what I have here is, this is actually a buck converter circuit that we designed earlier on this channel. And so I want to kind of just give you an example of these being used in real life. So you see we have these array of capacitors right here. We have that 22 microfarad, the 0.1 microfarad, and the 0.01 microfarad capacitor. And that's exactly what these are doing. They're acting as low impedance pathways to ground or any type of like high frequency noise or anything like that and help us maintain that five volt even smooth signal. Now I'm sure you're probably wondering, we just learned that capacitors sum in parallel. So why do we have three separate capacitors when it should be pretty easy just to find like a 22.11 microfarad capacitor? Why don't we do that? We can save a lot of money and space on our board. And that's actually a really good segue into part two of the series, which is capacitors aren't perfect in real life. There are parasitic elements that you have to take into account that affect their ability to filter out high frequency noise. So the short answer is because each of these capacitors that we've chosen right here is better at filtering out certain frequency ranges of noise. And then by having them all combined on the same uh, like five volt line, we're able to have um, you know much broader effect across the frequency spectrum and just do a better job of filtering. So we'll explore that more in part two, but that's kind of the short answer. So this is pretty much everything I wanted to cover in part one. Thank you so much if you made it to the end of this video, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.